<laughs> so I was thinking about it, and I put the catalog to CNBC, and they had some strange program on. They didn't have stock posts. And I said, oh, this is really a special Friday. What's happening? So the world is kind of closed, and here we are, right? This is Good Friday. It's uh, Passover time. Passover started a couple days ago. Uh, what else? It's tax day is coming up. <laughs> you know, it's a very special Friday. And here we are talking about systems, science, and engineering, and applications, and the past and the future. You know, and we're so happy and all that. So it's just an amazing thing that we're all here together on the stage. And I just wanted to say that when we when we planned it for, for uh, we were trying to plan it for some time this semester, this was really the only time that we could do it. it there are other events going on, you know, I don't know, information theory meetings, communication meetings, uh, all kinds of activities. This was the only time that people were very gracious and very positive and willing to come and very happy to come. We have a great turnout. We have great speakers today, so it's wonderful. Uh, the day is turning out so well. I don't want to take a lot of time for speaking. I just would like to introduce Professor John Barris, who is our founding director, who's going to introduce the first. Thank you all for coming. It's a special day for all of us. And it's my distinct pleasure to introduce a person who uh, has helped enormously in the success of this uh, institute. And, and that's Brit who is our chancellor since 2002. Uh, Brit is a very well recognized academic leader. And in 2002, was elected to be a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has many honors. We, uh, he went away for 40 years in Ohio State. Uh, those of us who knew him for more than 30 years, the news was going to be only temporary. And he came back. He was president of uh, this university, the University of Maryland College Park, for 10 years. I know him for all my life here in Maryland, since I came. He was in Panama Mathematics. He happened to be in Complex Variables, where I worked a lot when I did my PhD thesis. He and other colleagues in Mathematics used to call me the spy in electrical engineering. And that meant I was uh, to be in uh, various committees for PhD exams and so on. He has been uh, given various influential positions by President Bush. He was on the board of advisors of historical and black universities. He uh, was appointed to be in the National Commission on Mathematics and Science and Teaching uh, for the 21st century by President Clinton and many other honors. Let me share with you a few remarks regarding SRC and then ISR. Bill was uh, enthusiastically supporting uh, this whole activity, I want to say even from the pre-proposal days. So even when this was just a thought that NSF might do something like that because of the report that came that there were deficiencies in engineering, education, and so on. And then, of course, he was an enthusiastic supporter for the proposal and throughout, even after the NSF support stopped. And what characterized this in this effort was he was accessible to the leadership of the Institute and to many of us. He was very accessible to hear us, talk to us, to help us to make, take take our wild and daring ideas and make them reality. And two things are important to be told. Three, first of all, he was in all the NSF factories, which is important. So he went with us through the drilling from the NSF side visitors and visitors out of the other. Then he was instrumental in getting us space. The first wing of the A.V. Williams building was built by an ingenious financial scheme that was fearless and daring and brief made in the reality. And we got the first wave of the AV going to do And then, to top that, he was instrumental in getting us the almost $3 million of permanent funding for the state that made the center an institute. And that helped tremendously to, uh, to, to, to support us in everything we've done. So, we consider him a teammate in, in ISR. All of the folks that started ISR are still around. And with that, I would like to welcome you. Thank you very much, John. That was uh, such a wonderful introduction. And I have to say, I can't think of a team uh, I'd rather be on than the ISR team. Well, except maybe our women's basketball. <laughs> <laughs> I want to uh, thank uh, Ed and others for allowing me to participate in this uh, 20th anniversary celebration. Uh, and of course, there is so much to celebrate with ISR. I, I would say in, in many ways, IR, ISR's success over the past 20 years has mirrored 
that of the university. ISR has been both a cause and an effect of the university's rising national status. The ultimate 20 year payoff of ISR, uh, the thing that makes all of us so proud and is the real cause of celebration, is of course the quality of the people and research associated with the institute and the impact its research and education programs have, have had and are having on our state and our nation. As I look back on uh, the institute, I see three other very specific things that it has done and done superbly well to advance the Clark School of Engineering and the university. I'd like to comment briefly on, on each of them. First, by becoming one of NSF's initial six engineering research centers, ISR provided dramatic evidence to the external world of the university's rising quality. Harvard eagerly joined as our partner in our proposal, a statement in and of itself, for one of the most competitive and substantial programs the engineering division of NSF has ever administered. I don't recall call the names of the schools who did not win in this conference, but I do recall that it was a who's who of the best universities and engineering programs in the nation. The, the second thing the Institute has done for the university is to strengthen our capabilities in what has become so vitally important in today's world, interdisciplinary research. Back in the 80s, Science and engineering were emerging from, from an extended period of sub specialization The joke in my discipline of mathematics in the 70s and 80s was that we were educating a generation of students who knew more and more about less and less. If we continued in this direction, we would soon reach a point where graduates would know everything about nothing. Today, of course, Progress on many of the most important problems in science and technology requires collaboration from teams of people bringing expertise from across disparate fields. There's no question that the Institute helped the university become a leader in interdisciplinary research. Today, we, we have an abundance of multidisciplinary programs on the campus in cognitive studies, bioinformatics, global Chinese affairs, etc., etc., etc. But that was not the case in 1986. Because of the very nature of systems engineering, the Institute was dependent upon the collaboration of people from many areas, electrical, mechanical, and other areas of engineering, computer science, mathematics, physics, even the social sciences, to name a few. This forced the university to modify its policies and practices, to break down the walls created by departmental structures, and to build the means to support meaningful research collaboration across the campus. We eliminated many of the barriers and the bureaucracy for making and supporting joint appointments across departmental and college lines. For example, one important aspect of the original institute proposal, which made quite an impression on NSF and the visiting team, was the change in policy that gave the director of the institute a direct and significant role in promotion and tenure decisions for faculty from departments across the campus with joint appointments in the institute. So I think it's fair to say that the institute has played a crucial role in building the culture and capacity of the University of Maryland to be a leader in inter interdisciplinary research. The third area where ISR has made such an important contribution is in building university collaboration with private sector and government labs. Part of the challenge in developing our winning proposal was to demonstrate that the Institute would have a mission that would attract investment from the external world. I don't recall the number now, but the final proposal had an impressive array of companies and labs that not only expressed, expressed support for the Institute, but we're willing to pay substantial dues and become an institute affiliate. While other programs existed that connected the university to the external world, this was one of the first to do so in such a systematic and structured way 
and with invested and contributing partners. Of course, this has become an accepted and expected practice across the campus today. Indeed, the opening of the university to the larger world, the breaking down of the walls of the ivory tower, which the Institute led, has been one of the most positive and constructive developments of the university over the past 20 years. So in addition to, to the world-class research that goes on at the Institute for Systems Research, these three items, the signal of the university quality, the development of a culture to support interdisciplinary research, and the connection to the external R&D community, is a pretty impressive set of complementary contributions the Institute has made to the advancement of this, of this university. Given the impact of the Institute on the University, I think it's appropriate to mention a few people who are so responsible for its success. First, or should I say, in the beginning, there was John Barrett, <laughs> who, who conceived the idea of the Institute and, and pursued its creation with an intensity and doggedness that cannot be adequately described in the time I have. I know that it's difficult for those of you who know John to imagine this shy, retiring person <laughs> being so aggressive in the pursuit of his dream. But believe me, I still have mental scars from a very difficult conversation about institutional support for the institute. In all seriousness, John was the perfect person to lead this effort. His standards of quality, his drive and energy, his willingness to be audacious in pursuing support for his vision, his single-minded focus on winning this competition cannot be overstated. We would not be here today celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Institute were it not for John Barrett. So John, we all owe you an enormous respect. <laughs> decided to step down as director, it was crucial for us to find someone of considerable stature to become the Institute's leader. It was a mark of John's and the Institute's success that we were able to attract Steve Marcus to lead UT and to come to UN. His, his was a different but no less effective style. His appointment, in effect, was affirmation that the Institute had developed the quality and national rep reputation to be a continuing, vital, and vibrant entity. And when Steve Tech stepped down, we were once again blessed to have first Rep. Gary Rubeloff and now EI to step in and become such effective leaders. Under their direction, we have seen new directions and new emphases, but there is one immutable constant over the past 20 years. High quality research and education in an area of great importance to the university, the state, and the nation. I finally mention a person who unfortunately isn't with us, but here this afternoon, who deserves much credit for the Institute, and so much more, George Dieter. George was a champion of the center from the start, and gave John Barris the emotional, financial, and institutional support necessary to develop the winning proposal. George, of course, laid the foundation for the exceptional Clark School of Engineering, now so ably led by Nariman Bavard. So to all these gentlemen, let me say thank you. We are blessed to have at this university, and in the state of Maryland, one of the world's best schools of engineering. And, as we all know, the reputation of this great school has been built in no small measure on the reputation of the institute we so appropriately celebrate today. Happy birthday to the Institute for Systems Research. This just happens to be my birthday as well. Thank you.
did recognize George Jeter. He couldn't be here at lunch, so we recognized him in the morning. Uh, along with Congressman Farbardian and President Moe. So I also forgot to mention that our sponsor for this event is Northrop Grumman Corporation. And George Reynolds is here today, and we'll be recognizing him in a little while as well from Northrop Grumman. Uh, Northrop Grumman has been a sustaining partner of the Institute of Systems Research for quite a number of years. And uh, usually we have to make a few phone calls to get some funding from them, but this time I think he said yes after the first phone call. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll uh, mention that again in a little bit. Uh, it's a bit unusual. So, of course, ISR was started through, was the brainchild of uh, Dr. John Barris, uh, and it was uh, started with funding from the National Science Foundation. The director of the National Science Foundation at that time was Eric Block. Eric Block could not be with us today because of Passover, and so also Lynn Preston from NSF is a very good friend of the Institute of Systems Research, and she is here with us, and she's going to uh, say a few words. She's Deputy Division Director of the Engineering Directorate, and she's leader of the NSF Engineering Research Center's program, which still continues to today, and uh, she's a strong advocate of multidisciplinary research. She's been with the National Science Foundation since the 1970s, where she joined a program at NSF called at that time Research Applied to National Needs. Uh, in 2000, Lynn Preston received the NSF Engineer of the Year Award, uh, and recently she's been elected Fellow of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering. As I said, she's a strong, strong advocate of multidisciplinary research at NSF, and she has a big impact on ERCs all over the country. I think she probably knows them all inside and out. She's, she's a strong supporter of us to this day. The ERC program focuses on the definition of fundam fundamental, the definition of fundamental understanding and development and validation of the technologies needed to realize well-defined well classes of engineering systems with the potential to spawn new industries and radically transform current industries. So with that, I would like to introduce Lynn. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I think starting up an engineering research center is sort of like birthing something, <laughs> and you never know what's going to come out the other end. <laughs> but what a wonderful, wonderful history you've had. And I want to I want to bring you back a little bit in history to explain where this program came from. Rick did a great job of, uh, of laying that out. I think I'll put some personal spin on it. You can remember in the mid '80s. Uh, our industry was sort of fat and comfortable, and yet there were a lot of complaints that our graduates from our esteemed academic institutions were not only becoming narrow, as you mentioned, but also knew nothing about real engineering. They were becoming scientists more and more. Now, the scientific underpinning under engineering was necessary. We came out of World War II, we understood how powerful and important engineering was, but we also understood we needed more fundamentals. But I think NSF and others tipped that balance a little bit too far the other direction. Industry was saying, whoa, it takes us four or five years to make your graduates useful. And you've got to do something about it. So that's what a lot of this was going on. And our graduates at that time who didn't really know how to design very well, they had very little experience in, in integrating knowledge with the technological advancement. Systems, they knew nothing about. So that was our, our challenge. It came through the White House and the National Academy. And if any of you have dealt with the National Academy, now normally it takes them three years to produce a report. But under the guidance of Eric Block, we had the ERC program defined in like three months. <laughs> And that was 84. And we put out um, our first solicitation uh, with a team of about three people. I was fortunate enough to be one of the leaders of that team. Both of us, the, uh, Pete Mayfield and myself, we were in this program called Research Applied to National Needs because we had a passion to make sure that all this basic knowledge was sitting in academia and going into publication would become useful to society, would become useful and, and really spawn the development, the further development of our economy. So that's why we got selected into this and it's been a, del it's been a delight, obviously, to start it and, and to see it fulfilled. I think that Britt gave a really wonderful explanation of the, one of the insidious motivations of the ERC program was 
not only to define, as we've talked about, centers that are focused in interdisciplinary ways on large systems in partnership with industry, really active partnership, intellectual partnership with industry, move all that into education. But the other part was a culture change. We were designed to be a forcing function, to break down the disciplinary barriers, and Bridget really talked beautifully about just how that happened here, and we were really, really proud of that. So, the first competition occurs, and we had 143 proposals. <laughs> that was, I think, still a record. <coughs> and we all handled those. And um, a part of our process is always to pull proposal, and then we get down to site visit. And then we get down to a final panel where the proposing and leading groups come, come in and uh, speak before the panel. So uh, John says he still remembers me coming to get him <laughs> before the panel, and which is something we still do. But I think one of the things that, what did we look for? You know, we looked for passion, vision. We looked at all these pieces that could split apart, were together in, in the vision and in the structure of the center. As Britt said, we looked for administrative things that would make it happen. We were going to put a center in place. And all of a sudden, you know, tenure and promotion wouldn't recognize the disciplinary research, wouldn't recognize the integration of research and education. We'd be right back where we started. So we had to come into universities who were willing to change. We had to have leaders like John who had a passion. If you look at those first six, every one of them had a passion and a vision. We still sometimes have to describe to the engineers when they're proposing ERCs. Now, what's the vision? <laughs> we really want people to push out for a real big 10-year real 10-year vision, very hard to do vision. So for them, it was the design and control of large-scale, spatially distributed engineered systems. That was the first vision system, I think, if I can characterize that, at a time when a lot of people weren't thinking in that way. And the systems people were pretty mathematical. And why did we pick you guys? <laughs> Because you could come with the theory, with the mathematical capabilities, and tie it into real applications. That was the real, real difference. Because we wanted to make sure the intellectual capability was there, and that was going to go into use. So that's, that's because of why. The industry is a partner with us, and this, move, this knowledge has to move into use. We have to train our students to be, to be better engineers. So that's why we selected the University of Maryland. And uh, when we first started the program, right away, we had everybody in for a big banquet. Uh, after that, we sat around the table with our first annual meeting, the 12 or so of us. <laughs> and now our annual meetings are 200 people. But we all sat down and said, OK, now here we are. Now how do we do this? And I think in the first few years, we all learned from each other. We still do. We really learned from each other what it was going to mean to take on a challenge like this. Part of that process, I knew right away, had to be a post-award of perspective where we would go on campus with site teams again every year to make sure that um, that you really did what we asked you to do. And a, and a very important part of, of everything that we did in the early years was a very strong relationship with industry and with uh, state governments and others that were in partnership with us to do this. So John led us in lots of different ways at that time, and his vision and passion were clearly evident, as well as his high, high level of, of intellect. But I was just to think, now also he was our youngest center director, still, I think. <laughs> I used to think, now what, what else did John do besides study uh, mathematical systems research? Somewhere around that dining room table at home, there must have been a lot of strategic thinking. <laughs> he was one of our best thinkers, but now I understand that also the university came around and helped with a lot of that. So I think the partnership was really, really important in the early years. So without that, all center directors, you know, you can't do it without everybody coming around to support and working together. And another, another part of the center was a very strong partnership with the state, and still a unique partnership among all the centers. We've made, we've made about 43 centers, I think. And here we had this dedicated investment after, I guess it was one site that was a 50 or 60 year, you were saying, I'm going to do the legislature and nail down the money. 
and uh, and they got nailed down. And it was really, really important to develop the partnership, um, not only to, to help us support this huge mission, but to see that it fed into the economic development of the state, both in terms of research and education. And it gave the center a stability that in which it could build for the future for where we are now. Because I, I really think that that's extremely important. So that was very important to us. Um, so, you know, as we came into those years, also I, I want to remember Ralph Schlenker. Ralph was wonderful. He came here from Exxon, I think. And he was, uh, on our side of the table, an industry guy. <laughs> and on your side of the table, an industry guy. He taught us a lot about industry, a lot about technology transfer. He was the education guru, not only here, but within the early years of the program. He was a wonderful heart for the, for the center, and we all missed him when he unfortunately died at a reasonably young age. So I did want to remember him. So John um, decided, what was that, around sixth year, that you were going to spin out, I, I kind of call it like the Systems Research Center, we're going to call the ISR now, was the mothership, and you were going to take these satellite models of what an ERC was, and, and the first one was with NASA, and I guess you've had many more since then. So when that first happened, I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> what's going to happen to the ERC? But with Steve coming and leading it as he did, uh, and gelling it for its next four or five years, because that's a very risky time in the center, and faculty begin to think, oh, NSF's the only way. You know, maybe we should go do our own thing again, and they won't be bothering us anymore. But he kept it together, not only that, he grew it intellectually, uh, both in terms of research and education, I really appreciate your coming to do that. It was very important for all of us. And then um, when you decided you had enough of us, <laughs> Gary came. Now, we knew Gary before, because Gary had been at IBM. He was a partner at our of several centers, right? and especially at our North Carolina Center in Electronic Materials Project. And he became the direct, deputy director, director that one? What were you, Gary? Hmm? Deputy. Deputy, okay. <laughs> So coming here, he, he assumed a role that he was used to, comfortable with from both sides. And I think that was extremely important because that was the graduation time, wasn't it? Again, a risky time. I mean, away goes this chunk of NSF money, which was pretty healthy. Fortunately, the state money stayed, the university's commitment stayed. Industry had been a very strong partner. So that helped uh, the center stay on track and, and to grow. And then when I took over recently, right? <laughs> He's, he's, he was in a position to be able to grow it even more, and I understand you're going in biological systems directions, you're going in lots of new directions that you should be going in in order to strengthen the center. One thing I want to close with, we recently did a grad, uh, survey of our graduate centers. We have 16, and you know, I know I'm afraid of you, but some are live as dead, but I wanted to find out you know, what was happening. I gave this great report, and you get a star. <laughs> you have the most money, the most things going. You really, really are still a star among the 16 that have graduated. So again, congratulations. <laughs>
John is uh, well known and highly regarded for his development of DirecTV and DirecPC. Uh, no, ISR didn't help build direct TV. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell the rest of the story. Uh, this is a very good story uh, about uh, industry and academic collaboration. And uh, again, uh, John Barris is, is significantly responsible. We've been involved with ISR through the Center for Hybrid and Satellite Communications Networks, which we just changed to HiNet, for about 10 years now, maybe a little longer. And I'm at, uh, currently in a position on the board as I'm chair of the board for HINET. We've worked with John on many different things, and one of the most successful, or the most successful, that I'd like to talk about for a minute, actually is an outgrowth of the MIPS program, which I know will make her happy. Um, and this is uh, an excellent example of how the uh, industry and the university and the state got together and made a big success for this state and for, for our company. Um, about 12 years ago, Hughes was looking into what was going to become DirecTV. And uh, they were working closely with RCA Thompson, but a key piece that they needed to develop was a very inexpensive uh, broadband demodulator. And if they couldn't make an inexpensive broadband demodulator, they couldn't make a cheap set-top box. So they came to us because we had been doing a lot of work in broadband communications for big satellite networks. And we developed this little demodulator. And we started selling it to Thompson and they created the set-top boxes. Um, Hughes then turned to us and said, we'd like a second source or a third source for set-top boxes. We already had RCA, we had Sony. How would you like to get into, into the consumer business? And we said, sure, why not? It's your money, Mike. It was Mike Armstrong. And uh, that story ended up becoming, we went from last place becoming RCA and Sony to first place, and we ended up building 16 million set-top boxes for DirecTV. About the same time as we started on this demodulator, we had an idea, a couple of fellows that that Hughes had an idea, why couldn't we send data over the satellite as well? And in, in particular, the internet was exploding, why not internet access over satellite? The key problem we had to solve though was that the internet runs on TCP IP and TCP IP doesn't work well at all over satellite, especially if the return path is going to be by telephone link, so you have an asymmetric path. You have a high-speed broadband out route and a slow in route, and the TCP protocol just wouldn't work. So we started a small project here with, with John and his team and a, a graduate student called Aaron Falk to develop what became known as asymmetric TCP. And I still remember an article in the Washington Post about 10 years ago that said it would never work, that you couldn't run the internet over satellite because of the latency and the asymmetric. Uh, an engineer in our group, Doug Dillon, put together the small prototype, and I remember we showed it at Interop, I think it was 96 Interop, and uh, we started a small business. And I think that first year, uh, uh, we, we sold, I don't know, maybe $100,000 worth of this stuff, at a, at, but there was nearly $1,000 each, so it was certainly early adopters that were buying it. Um, as of this month, we will have shipped a million direct, direct PC, direct way receivers. We have uh, 300,000 consumers in the U.S. And we're going after that part of the market um, where there's about 20 million to 30 million households in the U.S. that are not going to be served by DSL and cable and, and fiber. So that's a, a pretty big market for us. Um, the MIPS grants, actually, I think there was three that we did. It was follow-on, and John, John and his team were brilliant in keeping us in that. And that then be became our core business. And we still pay a royalty check to the university every year for all the boxes we ship. And we're more than happy to do it. Last year, the revenue for this business for us was $800 million. And I roughly estimated that since we started, we're somewhere between two and three billion dollars, depending on how you count. 
Um, we've done many MIPS projects since then, but none have been quite as successful as that one. We've hired 30 to 40 of uh, John's students. Uh, and even if you don't use DirectWay today, which is now called Usenet, we just announced that at the beginning of the month, because we separated from DirectCZ and they kept the direct name, so we're called Usenet. You probably encounter our system every day, whether you're a consumer or not. If you buy gas, you're over our system. If you go to Walmart or a KFC or a McDonald's, Cracker Barrel, Jiffy Lube, and almost every car dealer in the U.S. is on this network. So you probably encounter this network uh, several times a day. And th this basically has become our company up in Germantown. And I want to thank the ISR and John and the center for for having the vision and working with us to get to get to this point. We're looking forward to the next 10 years of what we can do together. I'm a, I'm a graduate of the business school here, so I have to put a word in here. <laughs> well, you know, the business school is almost part of ISR, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. so much for your support and collaboration. I think that's really very critical to us to get great ideas from industry and work with industry on solving uh, important problems. Our next speaker is Secretary Eris Melissaratos. Did I pronounce that right? Secretary of, in the Department of Business and Economic Development of the State of Maryland since January 2003. So the mission of DBED is to strengthen Maryland's economy and promote Maryland as a, as a prime location for tourism, industry, technology, minority business development, and advancement of the arts. Mr. Melissaratos is former executive of Westinghouse Electronic Systems, which is now North of Grumman Electronic Systems. While he was at Westinghouse, first of all, that's where his association with the University of Maryland and Institute for Systems Research started, and uh, it's continued. Uh, in his new position as Secretary of uh, Development in the state. When he left his position at Westinghouse, he was Vice President and General Manager of the Design, Engineering, and Manufacturing Operations Divisions. He was responsible for 16,000 employees there and $3.2 billion in annual revenues. After that, he joined Thermo Electron Corporation as Corporate Vice President and later founded Armel Private Equity Investments to provide funding and strategic direction to high technology startup companies. His degrees, he doesn't have a degree from the University of Maryland, he has degrees from our competitors in the area. John Hopkins, <laughs> George Washington, did graduate work also at uh, Catholic University. But we don't hold that against him because he's such a good friend. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First, let me bring you greetings from Governor Ehrlich and all your friends in Annapolis who really took care of the high higher education system uh, in the state so well this year. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kerwin has been smiling ear to ear since uh, early February to find out what his budget was going to be. Is the 14.5% growth rate still the best in the country? Is the 14.5% annual budget growth the best in the country? We need to keep it that way. Uh, Dr. Tenden, I guess, left the teacher's class. I thank you for the tribute to MIPS, uh, because we thought enough of MIPS that we doubled this budget this year. That's not saying a lot. It's only going from a million, a million and a half to three. It's not a lot of money. But it is a great program. So I thought maybe this was a tribute to MIPS today, but and now we're here to celebrate John and ISR. And I was so proud back in the mid-80s when the University of Maryland was picked as one of the first six centers, because I thought it was a great honor for the state to have one of the first NSF centers in this uh, area. And I was particularly proud that uh, John had picked Harvard to, uh, to partner with, uh, because I thought it brought the university some prestige. You see, at that time, the university needed a little more prestige than it had then. Uh, but since then, we've made such dramatic progress 
and I've often told Britt and George Dieter and every one of their successors how, how proud we were of them and how we felt they were totally irreplaceable and then how the system brought people in place to replace the George Dieters and the Bill Desslers and to give us people like Narriman and to give us people like Dan Mouth and then bringing Britt back as Chancellor because this system, ladies and gentlemen, has made such dramatic progress in every one of its, its 13 campuses. And uh, that's why, uh, Britt, we're so proud of what the university system is doing and how it's driving the economy of the state. Uh, ISR and John Barrett's. Uh, I was going to give this speech in Greek. So John and I could understand. <laughs> when they talked about John's strategic vision, I know that it was his frequent trips to Greece where he got the inspiration for the next big thing. <laughs> but literally, I have to thank John on behalf of Westinghouse Electric Corporation because in the mid-80s, we were taking giant steps forward. We were growing from a billion dollar a year business in 83 to a three billion dollar a year business in 85 and uh, we needed more systems thinking and there were no systems engineering programs available and the recognition that uh, technology breakthroughs would occur at the boundaries among disciplines uh, was not there yet and John's vision for creating the center uh, and making it a systems engineering institute that thought across disciplines certainly helped us in achieving the complex radar processing problems of AWACS and F-16 and B-1 and the countermeasures problems. Unfortunately, we were not like Hughes. We were too arrogant in our defense-oriented thinking and did not apply technology to the commercial sector. And it was fun to watch uh, outfits like uh, Kenyon just talked about uh, develop technology for commercial purposes. And John had the vision for that because he was partnering with Lucent and Hughes and every major commercial R&D company in the country and bringing that interdisciplinary thinking to our campus here. Uh, certainly Westinghouse has profited a lot. Uh, we did programs here in reliability engineering, in, uh, in uh, concurrent engineering, uh, because that was the vogue of the day, concurrent engineering, design and process at the same time. But none of it paid off as much as systems engineering, systems thinking. And uh, I have literally uh, a need to thank John and all the visionaries that ran this center over its last 20 years uh, for their vision to bring the systems thinking to the ball game. Uh, both on behalf of Westinghouse, that is now so well succeeded by uh, my friend George Reynolds and Northrop Grumman, uh, but for the state of Maryland, because I think you've created a foundation uh, that has permitted this engineering school uh, to reach the levels that Naramus leadership is taking it to. Uh, to be 15th in the nation and 9th among all the public universities it's truly an honor, and I think we have a foundation in place here uh, that will take us further up that, that comparison curve because of the kind of strategic thinking and entrepreneurial thinking. And again, working at the boundaries across disciplines, the Bio Nanotech Initiative, that we got a little bit of funding for, it's not a lot of money, but I think that I think Narriman and Britt and the university system will probably leverage that to 100 or maybe 300 million dollars over the next few years with other, with other contributions because we're getting good at leveraging. But when Narriman gives you his strategic uh, vision for the engineering school, you literally see society unfolding because we're touching all the right places. And Nanobio certainly is one of those nice places. And certainly the Bob Fischel a contribution to put uh, biomedical uh, and systems thinking in place. Uh, and the more we can get, again, working across the various schools on every campus and getting all the campuses to work together, and the further it get the public and the privates to work together, as maybe Nana Bio will help us achieve, uh, the discipline of systems engineering, of systems thinking, of managing the boundaries will help this state economy reach even greater heights. And just to let you know how much importance the government places on technology as an economic development strategy, it is our number one economic development initiative, the Maryland's one Maryland economy, giving every citizen the opportunity, both demographically and geographically, to participate in wealth creation, is founded on achieving technological dominance. Technological dominance can only be achieved on the shoulders of thinkers, such as John Barrett, such as I am, such as all of the graduate students who are learning to apply 
theoretical disciplines to solving the world's problems. So John and all of your colleagues at ISR and in the Institute for Hybrid and Satellite Communications and whatever else you dream of. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for your leadership. Britt, Naraman, Ayad. Thanks to all of you. But to all the students, to all of the colleagues, you're the people that contribute to this. Keep thinking in an advanced fashion to move our economy from the state and the world forward. Thank you very much.
staff member who knows everybody, you know, in the ISR and takes care of so many different things. You know, she just handles, I don't know, 80% of the work in ISR maybe. <laughs> she keeps things moving. She's got a, what she calls a tickler system. You know, I didn't know what that was before. I used to just remember getting tickled by my parents. <laughs> Reminds her of things, deadlines before they, before they come up and so on. She just keeps everything moving. There's, you know, joint appointments. We have a complicated system of joint appointments with departments and everything. She keeps everything on track. Uh, and now she's in charge of payroll as well. I, we're just so grateful to Sue for all her work, all her contributions to the ISR. I see she has friends in high places. <laughs> okay, next I'd like to recognize our past directors. And the first one I'd like to recognize is my predecessor, Dr. Gary Rubloff, who joined us from North Carolina State University, and he was recruited to be a professor here, and then they said, well, why don't you come as director too, you know? So, <laughs> you know, so this was also a big coup for us to, to bring uh, Gary in from North Carolina State. Uh, where he was involved in the Engineering Research Center over there. He also has a prior career at IBM where he was just a prolific researcher. I told Gary he didn't know the citation index beats everybody in this room. He's just an amazing researcher. And he's continuing to develop in new directions. He made great strides for the ISR and moved us into new directions in biological and in MEMS and uh, manufacturing, semiconductor manufacturing. So he's made a great contribution to the ISR. And now he's making other great contributions as head of the university's nanotechnology in the center. And because of all his hard work and letting everybody know about all the work in nanotechnology and bringing it all together and spearheading new research, we were ranked number one in nanotechnology in the country this year by, uh, by an industry magazine. Gary, can you come up and accept your work? To Gary W. Rubloff for his significant contributions as director of the Institute 1996 to 2001. Thank you. So, when Gary arrived here, it was, what did I say, 1996? So, the NSF funding was just finishing. So, he was lucky in a way and unlucky in a way. He was unlucky because we had less money. But he was lucky because he didn't have to do the annual report. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have to do the three year or then they made it like a two year renewal application. To get all the faculty together in rooms where they would have to brainstorm and write reports and form teams that would be documented and so on and so forth. He didn't have to do all that, so he was able to go in these new directions. And I think that was very lucky for him. And we ended up getting more money than NSF was giving us anyway. <laughs> so overall that was probably a very good experience. Of course, the director just prior to Gary Rubloff was our good friend, Stephen Marcus, who has been mentioned a couple of times today. Steve Marcus is a colleague in my own, my own area of control theory, who we brought, recruited from uh, University of Texas at Austin. And I know that John Barrett and Krishna Prasad played a big role in recruiting him at CDC conferences, I don't know, in such nice places as Hawaii or whatever. They <laughs> chose nice places to try to convince him that he should at least interview here. And it wasn't an easy thing to do, but uh, Steve finally decided that he'll at least come and take a look. And I had met Steve once before, I don't know, we were at another conference, and I was very impressed by him because he's a real gentleman and a real scholar, and he's a caring human being about, uh, about society and so on, and uh, a great researcher. And so he came, and he's also a very organized person. And so he was here, like I said, Gary's predecessor, so he was here and we were still under NSF funding, and he made sure that we got every last drop of NSF funding. <laughs> that was possible. So we ended up with 11 years of funding from NSF. And I remember vividly Steve working late at night in the conference room, 2168, bringing together the faculty that were needed for that particular part of the proposals and the renewals and so on. And he's just a maverick. And he also kept his research program going, and he stepped down for a few years from being director because he, was, he just wanted to get back in, in a bigger way in his research program. Then, of course, at some point, the chair of electrical engineering became dean, and uh, Steve was recruited as acting chairman. 
and in the end he became chairman again. And now he's back with the regular faculty. So we all we all, all owe Steve a big debt of gratitude, and I'd like to present him with his plaque of appreciation. By the way, these are really beautiful plaques on what's called piano cherry. <laughs> so, for his significant contributions as director of the institute, 1991 to 1996. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to go on. I have to find the right paperwork for the next step. Let's see. I was really lucky that all day I was able to sit down after presenting one person I could sit down and look at my notes. The next person I'd like to recognize is the director of MTech. Now let me look at my papers because I don't quite remember who that is. Just <laughs> 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 don't get mad at me. Uh, I had some really nice notes on her. Herb Raven was the uh, deputy assistant Secretary of the Navy at one time. He was also a leader at the Naval Research Lab before that. Uh, he joined us from the position in the Navy. And he was actually recruited to establish the Engineering Research Center, which is a different Engineering Research Center than the Institute for Persistent Research. It was, a research. it was a center that was to be devoted to collaboration with industry. And Herb came and you know he, he joined and he's a faculty member in electrical and computer engineering, but also he established that ERC. And not only did he establish it, but it's been such a big success. It's, it's been an amazing success. For somebody who spent a lot of his career doing research in all different kinds of areas of physics, electrical engineering, and so on at the Naval Research Lab, he became a great uh, planner and organizer of people and, and uh, developer of this great organization, the ERC, which is now MTech. And uh, the MIPS program that you've heard about, the Maryland Industrial Partnerships Program, is part of MTech. And they've graduated a good number of companies that uh, are quite successful. And now they're working on a new research park and uh, park for venture capital, venture companies and so on. So Herb has been a great contributor to the university and to the College of Engineering. He's also served as interim dean on occasion. And I didn't mention his connection with ISR. I, Herb was very, very instrumental in, in helping to get ISR moving in the, in the early days and getting our collaborations with industry started in a big way. So I'd like to recognize her. And as well. 